So, kicking off things after lunch will be uh, a very on chronic illness in the world. And it will be done by the risk of casting, the ordinary cut and left perspective, the duration of the of the government. And it will see the rest of the surgery in the University of Colombo. Over to you, sir. Thank you. It is a great pleasure this afternoon. to introduce a uh, no stranger to sri lanka dr anton suradas pereira who is a assistant uh, professor of surgery and vascular surgeon at the university tennessee health science center he is a eminent uh, vascular surgeon there and uh, he will be uh, talking on uh, the venous ablation and its complication over to you surat let me start uh, good afternoon to everybody in colombo and uh, greetings from the united states if i'm sleepy and um, distracted that's because it's 2 a.m. here in the states and also we are in the middle of a hotly contested uh, presidential election um i want to thank the college of surgeons of sri lanka and uh, the society of vascular surgeons of uh, sri lanka for inviting me to talk at this uh, gathering it's always a pleasure and a great honor to address this august uh, meeting uh, and i also want to thank uh, professor mandik vidyarat in particular for extending the invitation to uh, speak on our experience uh, of uh, endovenous therapy for treatment of uh, chronic venous insufficiency uh, i tried to put to put this together at fairly short notice and wanted to focus on the our technical uh, experience and the complication rates in performing these procedures in a ambulatory care setting rajesh can you confirm with me whether you all hear me loud and clear very loud and clear very good thank you Um, I live and work in Memphis, uh, Tennessee, the uh, so-called home of the blues and the birthplace of rock and roll. It's also called the Bluff City because it's built on the banks of the Mississippi River, famous for Elvis Presley, who made his music. He lived here and died in Memphis. Also famous for so many historic events, including the assassination of uh, Martin Luther King. and memphis is also home to many civil rights monuments and museums including a uh, hotel lorraine where martin luther king was assassinated a fascinating place of course we are in the middle of this pandemic uh, i don't know how y'all spent your pandemic but i pursued a secondary career in motor sports this is our mercedes amg race car that i share with a british racing driver and we participate in uh, pre- one of the premier american racing series called the michelin pilot challenge and uh, representing um, the bluff city uh, you can see bluff city racing is our racing campaign it's a lot of fun lot more fun than fixing an aortic aneurysm i can tell you um, and uh, that's how i spend my days uh back to our topic uh, vascular and vein institute of the south is uh, my medical practice we are based in memphis with multiple satellite offices in the region just to give you some perspective of uh, uh, the kind of pra- practice and the work we perform a group of us six vascular surgeons and four nurse practitioners provide specialty care to the region we serve an area of Uh, but within 100 mile radius of memphis uh, and a population of over 3 million people so about varicose veins and chronic venous insufficiency just a brief introduction and overview varicose veins themselves are defined as subcutaneous veins in the lower extremities which are dilated to greater than 3 mm in diameter in upright position 
And as you all know, varicose veins constitute a progressive disease. Really, there's no cure or remission, except when it is associated with pregnancy, where there's some remission when pregnancy is uh, terminated or concluded. And underlying chronic venous insufficiency affects a third of the adult population in the Western world. Venous uh, ulcers themselves occur in about up to 4% of the older people over the age of 65 years. And broadly speaking, again, treatment options include conservative therapy with compression therapy being the mainstay. And uh, traditional treatment includes surgical vein stripping or high ligation and phlebectomy. The new therapies, of course, um, endovenous ablative therapies, laser radiofrequency ablation, which I'm going to talk to you briefly about today, and foam therapy. And there are several other new therapies being introduced as well. And then sclerotherapy also uh, has some uses in uh, treatment of uh, venous insufficiency. Um, the Society of Astral Surgery, based on preponderance of evidence, including multiple randomized control trials and multi, uh, met multiple meta-analysis, has recommended that endovenous ablation be used as the preferred mo therapeutic modality for treatment of incompetent saphenous veins over open surgery. Uh, to some of the specialists in this audience, I'm sure the results are well known. Uh, the convalescence rate duration convalescence rate is better, and there's less pain and morbidity associated with the uh, more minimally invasive procedure as compared to open surgery for comparable clinical outcomes. So at the Vascular Institute, we use the closure fast uh, endovascular radiofrequency ablation system uh, shown here in this picture. It delivers 120 degrees Celsius of uh, temperature uh, at 40 watts. It's a uh, pretty much is a thermal uh, ablation system. So 40 watts of energy is delivered and temperature goes up to 120 degrees within the vein. And, a disposable catheter is placed in the vein and a controlled amount of heat is delivered and it, the vein collapses and the disposable catheter is withdrawn and in segmental fashion, the target vein is treated this way. Resni, can I confirm with you uh, the video and the audio? Oh, very clear. Thank, Thank you. you. So, uh, I want to briefly show you with some photographs our system in a office-based ambulatory care setting. Uh, shown here is a uh, Logic S8 uh, ultrasound machine, state-of-the-art. Uh, it's manufactured by GE. Uh, the picture quality is amazing. And in the center is uh, the tumescent pump here with the uh, saline uh, and local anesthetic solution uh, seen here and the display of the closure fast uh, treatment system. This is a typical uh, suite in the office. So regular office room with, uh, with of course, a uh, surgical table and a conventional sterile setup. You can see my ultrasonographer uh, performs the procedure with me. This is uh, Brittany Scott, an ultrasonographer extraordinaire, one of the best I have seen. And the screen is in display here in a surgical assistant. Typical back table, just very simple, not so busy, just a bunch of uh, surgical paraphernalia, including scalpel and a few uh, syringes and needles. You don't need a whole lot for this procedure. And uh, this, of course, yours truly performing the procedure. You can see, in this case, the greater saphenous vein is being treated. The, the entry, entry is just behind, just below the knee, and you can see it clearly displayed on this uh, superb uh, ultrasound display. And uh, so lidocaine is introduced at the uh, access side, just around the knee, and, uh, and then uh, seven French sheath is inserted, 
and, and a catheter is introduced and you identify the saphenofemoral junction at this point and advance the catheter uh, within proximity of the saphenofemoral junction. And uh, I like to place my catheter within a few centimeters. The instructions we use would describe catheter placement within two to two and a half centimeters of the saphenofemoral junction. I, I err on placing it almost within five centimeters of the saphenofemoral junction simply to reduce the incidence of uh, so-called endovenous heat induced thrombosis rate or deep venous thrombosis that is associated with this procedure. Uh, you can see on the, on the last photograph, the catheter coming into picture in, uh, in, uh, in uh, association, in, uh, in the proximity of the saphenofemoral junction. After it is precisely placed, the tumescent is given. You have to place the catheter before the tumescent is given before, because if you give the tumescent beforehand, uh, the vein collapses and you can no longer see it under ultrasound. So uh, the, the tumescent anesthesia is simply a uh, injection of local anesthetic around the vein to create a cuff from the insertion site, the saphenofemoral junction in the case of the greater saphenous vein in a continuum. Um, so here you can see, uh, see me introducing the long, uh, I think it's say 18 gauge or, or similar size IV with, uh, with local anesthetic infusion. And the infusion pump is used to facilitate the ease of injection. If you hand inject this, you'll have a sore hand and a sore forearm at the end of the procedure and, and poorly anesthetized patient. And you, you follow this tumescent uh, on ultrasound, you can see the acoustic shadow of the catheter and the tumescent being introduced around the vein uh, uh, and or, or, or in, in, a, in serial fashion along the course of the vein. It is important to follow the acoustic shadow because that's the only way you can know after a certain point that you are around the uh, catheter. Sometimes you can't pick up the catheter, but the acoustic shadow can be easily picked up and on a very good ultrasound machine. And that is at least our technique. And we introduce a cuff of anesthesia uh, circumferentially. This, this is taken all the way to the um, saphenofemoral junction in this case. And uh, the, there is a thermosensitive sensor at the tip of the catheter. So as lidocaine is introduced, which is called saline solution, the temperature at the tip of the probe drops uh, to low 20s Celsius. And then you know that you are complete, completed the anesthesia introduction up to the uh, saphenofemoral junction where the tip of the catheter is placed. I, I don't have a slide to show that, but that is how, you know, the anesthesia is complete. And you can see in these panels, cuff of anesthesia being introduced around, around the saphenous uh, vein. This again, you can see in sequence, the acoustic shadow introduced by the catheter as the ultrasonographer follows the injection of uh, anesthesia along the course of the saphenous vein. And that is uh, me completing a, a tumescent injection. And so once that's done, the satisfied patient has been adequately anesthetized, segmental ablation is, uh, is, is started. At least that is the protocol with radiofrequency ablation as opposed to uh, laser therapy. Uh, the vein is treated in seven segment, seg seven centimeter segments, and a preset amount of heat is delivered until 120 degrees Celsius of uh, heat uh, of temperature is achieved, and and uh, at 40 watts of uh, thermal energy. You can see on ultrasound cross section the fuzziness along the catheter. That is when the, that is the image of the heat being generated and the vein collapsing around the catheter. Uh, this sequence of, uh, of photographs again show the same thing. And uh, you complete the 
ablation and the catheter is there after withdrawn and sheath is withdrawn and pressure is held and the patient is wrapped in a compressive bandage and and discharge after a few minutes in amb with an ambulatory capacity most of them walk out to their car and they are driven home i don't advise them to drive themselves uh, usually driven home but the recovery is immediate post operative instructions are also very simple we keep this bandage for two days and they wear their compression stocking afterwards um so this was a retrospective review uh, of Uh, 700 cases, but only 615 were available uh, for for us, uh, for study between January 1 of 2019 and September of 2020. Uh, altogether, 615 ablations were completed, but post-op ultrasound and documented follow-up was available only for 521 uh, patients, and they were analyzed and. Uh, 50% of approximately 50% of the patients were treated for CAP class 3 uh, clinical presentation meaning pain and swelling typically and uh, the remainder of them had more advanced disease as you can see uh, 30% of them had venous ulcerations uh, and that would clinically be in uh, C, C class C6 and the demographics average about 60 years of age reflecting the old age group that is typically affected but a broad range from 20 to 95 years of age and uh and, pred and, fe and predominantly females and this is consistent with uh, the experience all over the world i'm sure there is a case in sri lanka as well um predominantly the greater saphenous vein was treated but a fair number of perforated veins were treated now uh, what about that the i have not been able to show that device here in this presentation but uh, thermal energy is delivered using a stylet instead of a long catheter to treat the perforated vein and the procedure is fairly short once the perforate is identified uh, the stylet star type devices introduced directly into the perforator and uh, and the perforator is ablated again with heat so post of follow up is very uh, simple and uh, uh, in involves two steps an ultrasound can, scan is performed to assess closure of the treated vein and also to assess residual reflux uh, in these patients Uh, sometimes when the main greater saphenous vein is treated you tend to see other areas that are refluxing um following treatment so we do that assessment and also overall clinical assessment for complications and outcomes so we had a technical success rate of 97% um with only uh, 3% failed ablations and the majority of them were Perforators. So, but you have about two minutes. Yeah. Uh, perforators were challenging um, to uh, to treat and um, with hundred percent success. And our complication rate was overall forty four percent, and majority of them were simple complications. Nine patients had experienced pain. which which was 1.7% of the patient population and there were six cases of deep vein thrombosis and they were treated with anticoagulation for a few weeks with complete resolution so there were associated cellulitis in a small number of patient and few cases of superficial thrombophlebitis one vessel perforation which was easy to treat with compression and one case of major nerve injury actually my partner experienced this when he was treating a perforator had a, a in advert and thermal injury to the tibial nerve and patient had a foot drop and this was again managed conservatively so in conclusion uh, endovenous ablation can be performed with a high technical success rate of approximately 97% and a low complication rate of 4% uh, in a ambulatory outpatient care setting and in a safe manner thank you and uh, have you take some questions Thank you very much, uh, Surat. It was an excellent presentation. Uh, do, uh, do you uh, routinely give prophylaxis 
for uh, DBG prophylaxis for them? No, I don't. Uh, what type? What? Uh, it, it was very clear and informative. What is your strategy for dealing with the after the trunk is ablated for the other veins? The, the you mean so, uh, so are, are we? The stable version of sclerotherapy, or whether it's done later or the same. So it depends. It depends on the indication for which you're treating. Like if you take a patient with clinical C3 presentation, which is pain and swelling, our experience is once you treat the various saphenous reflux, they have almost complete resolution of symptoms. They no longer have pain and edema. I, I don't go after other smaller saphenous veins and flexing. Now, occasionally some patients are concerned about their cosmesis. In that case, I refer them for sclerotherapy uh, by other practitioners. I don't do sclerotherapy for cosmesis myself. Thank you very much, Surat, and our time's up. And thank you so much for getting up in the morning and helping us with this. Very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day.